Hello, welcome to this Friday afternoon edition. We appreciate everyone being with us today, particularly those members of the media that are here today. As some of you know, yesterday I was on the Mississippi Gulf Coast with FEMA Administrator Pete Gaynor, so I was not able to be with you, but we also know that we saw over a thousand new cases yesterday alone. As Dr. Dobbs will tell us here shortly, we also saw over a thousand cases again today. I know that I continue to say the same thing over and over, but it's because COVID-19 is not going away. The virus is real, it is deadly, it is highly contagious, it is spreading rapidly, and it is killing people across our state. These are our neighbors, they are our friends, and they are our family. No one is invincible. Some are personally less likely to end up on a ventilator, but we are all vulnerable to the immense pain of losing a loved one. It can hurt every single one of us in Mississippi. And in fact, it already is. My ask of you today is simple. Please continue to stay vigilant. Please wear a mask. Please try to stay away from others if you don't need to see them. Wash your hands and stay smart. Continue to socially distance. If we will do these little things, we can and we will beat this virus or at least prevent needless deaths. Our order to ensure stricter measures in 13 counties are set to expire on Monday because we had to align them with our safe return order. I just want to be clear this afternoon. I fully expect that both the safe return order and the additional measures in those 13 counties will be extended beyond Monday. We are looking at the data and at the information to determine whether additional counties need to be added. We are also pouring over the data to determine if other measures need to be added as well. For instance, we know that in the state of Texas, all bars have been closed. We know that in the state of Florida that they are not allowed to serve alcohol at bars. And so in talking with Dr. Burks a couple of days ago, in talking to Dr. Dobbs, this is certainly a, an area that we are looking at very closely. But whether we choose to put additional measures on for those in bars or not, understand that it is not necessarily safe for there to be tons and tons of people standing around partying. I also want you to know that earlier today we had an excellent meeting with Dr. Kerry Wright as well as Dr. Jason Dean, both the chairman of the board and our um, state superintendent of the Mississippi Department of Education. We talked extensively about the plans for reopening schools. We know that all districts will have submitted by the end of this month and we will be able to offer an even greater level of detail on what we believe and what we think of their efforts. Most are looking at a combination of in-person classes and some virtual learning. We all agreed that we cannot go any longer without our kids learning in classrooms. That's simply not reasonable. It's simply not possible. We talked a lot at the beginning of this pandemic about essential workers and essential services. I can think of nothing more essential than a child's education. Missing so much time, especially early on in their schooling, could and would destroy lives. Kids, especially those that are privileged, have an advantage. While kids, 
without fancy iPads and without parents who can watch them full time may never recover. We've got at least $150 million going to schools to pay for masks, hand sanitizer, and other necessary PPE. I'll personally guarantee if you need a mask, we'll get them to you. We've already given out nearly 5 million community masks in Mississippi, and we are prepared to do more. We've got every school district in the state working on their unique plan. I know that some people must think that I'm a genius, and therefore that I know better than every one of these local school leaders. They want me to do an executive order mandating that every school acts exactly the same. As of today, I do not see that as the best course of action. Every school district has until July 31 to complete their plans, turn them into the department, and I look forward to personally reviewing every single one of them. But I want to make sure that the people of Mississippi understand what the American Academy of Pediatrics came out and said that I believe is very important. The AAP strongly advocates, and this is a quote, the AAP strongly advocates that all policy considerations for the coming school year should start with a goal of having students physically present in school. The importance of in-person learning is well documented, and there is already evidence of the negative impacts on children because of school closures in the spring of 2020. Now, recently I've seen some intense rhetoric saying that opening schools will mean people will die. The American Academy of Pediatrics said that closing schools could in fact itself push children to a higher risk of death. They're right. We have to provide the structure for children. It is a tremendous privilege to be able to stay home, to get paid, and to have no worries. But most families in our state simply can't do that. We can't force every parent to homeschool their kids indefinitely. It's, insta it's insane to believe that that is a sustainable long-term policy. Our goal is to get kids back in school so that they can have structure, safety, and learning. We're going to do it with an overwhelming focus on public health. We're going to do it in a safe way. I believe that we can. In fact, I know that we can. We know that there is no safe way to abandon education. When I think about that second grader that maybe was struggling to read in the middle of last year. They were struggling to keep up. If we put them in a position in which they go an entire year, that may be a, a lost year to some, but to that kid who was already struggling, it may be a year in which it proves that they will never, ever be able to catch up. We had made tremendous progress over the last 10 years in educational attainment in our state. It's something that I am exceptionally proud of. We cannot give back those gains. Not for my benefit, not for the benefit of the privileged kids in our state, but we cannot give up those educational attainment gains for those individuals who have worked so hard, who maybe 10 years ago were struggling, maybe would have been a dropout, but instead have chosen to stay in school, have performed, have gotten better, and have made a better life for themselves. Today's second and third graders need that same opportunity, and I believe that we can do it in a safe, responsible way. Just like I believe we could get people back to work in a safe, responsible way. And so I want to thank everyone again for being here. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dobbs, who's going to give us an update on our cases today. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. 
Today we're reporting an additional 1,032 new coronavirus cases with sadly an additional 24 deaths. If we look at what's going on in the state, we see ongoing widespread community transmission. We know that any place that people gather, there's gonna be a risk of somebody spreading coronavirus. So it's so very important for people to follow the simple rules. And as a matter of fact, at this point, strongly recommend that people not congregate in groups at all. Stay home when you can, stay away from crowds, maintain six feet, and wear a mask. Again, if it's a social event, it's not critical to your well-being, recommend not doing it at this time. If we look at hospitalizations, we're seeing ongoing stress in our hospital system. Uh, we do have a stable number of patients in the hospital overall at 853 compared to 855 yesterday, but a, a small increase in the number of COVID uh, ICU patients up to 253 from 247. Uh, keep in mind that just a, a short five days ago, that number was 197. So that's a pretty marked increase. Every day we add 1,000 new cases, statistically that's another 170 patients that are gonna likely be in the hospital in the next couple of weeks. So we anticipate significant ongoing stress within our hospital system. And if we look at the number of facilities that have uh, zero ICU beds, there are eight major medical centers in Mississippi that currently have zero ICU beds, and we continue to get notifications of having to transfer Mississippi patients out of state for care. And as a matter of fact, not only could we not find an ICU bed last night for one Mississippi patient, we couldn't find an ICU bed in Louisiana and finally found one in Alabama. So again, this is a real situation that's gonna affect Mississippians, not necessarily with COVID, with other medical conditions. It's gonna be a significant stress. So please continue to be careful. We'll keep you informed. We are planning to post uh, hospitalization ICU data by region and by hospital type this afternoon. So uh, please be looking for that later today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Just as a reminder, here on Friday afternoon, uh, on Monday, we intend to extend our order. Uh, we do currently have 13 counties with, with uh, requirements to wear masks in public. Hines, DeSoto, Harrison, Rankin, Jackson, Washington, Madison, Grenada, Sunflower, Wayne, Claiborne, Quitman, and Jefferson counties are currently on the list. I also want to point out that the other counties that we are looking very, very closely at and monitoring very closely, which means that if you are in one of these counties over the weekend, you should be wearing a mask as well. Forrest, Jones, Lamar, Panola, Bolivar, Simpson, Tate, Covington, Walthall, Tallahatchie, Humphreys, and Sharkey counties are counties that we are looking very closely at. Um, remember, we have a very subjective um, uh, guide on monitoring these counties. Obviously, every day it changes a little bit, and that's why we're being very cautious about uh, adding counties. But it's 200 new cases over a two-week period or over 500 per 100,000 residents. And so you see that those nine counties that I just mentioned, um, or actually there's 11, uh, because when you look at Jones and Lamar, for instance, uh, one is at 196 and one is at 192 new cases in the last two weeks. And so while they don't necessarily meet the 200 threshold, I mentioned them just to let the people know in the Hattiesburg metropolitan area, um, we have challenges. We have a lot of new cases. That means we have a lot of transmission in your communities. And so take the necessary precautions uh, to protect yourselves and to protect your loved ones. Again, you know the 13 counties that we already have the, uh, the, the mask requirement in. I want to say again to Forrest and Jones and Lamar and Panola and Bolivar and Simpson and Tate and Covington and Walthall and Tallahatchie, in addition to Humphreys and Sharkey, you are on our list. You, we are monitoring very closely the numbers, and there is a very high likelihood uh, that uh, unless things change dramatically, over the next 48, excuse me, 24 to 48 hours, uh, that on Monday, uh, that, that those counties might be added uh, to the list. Again, I've said this repeatedly, I'm gonna say it again. I can sign whatever executive order I wanna sign, 
If you, the people of Mississippi, ignore it and don't pay attention to it or don't adhere to it, it doesn't do any good. It's the reason I'm here day after day after day. I'm trying to be transparent with you. I'm trying to simply tell you the facts as I see them. The numbers are the numbers. And we are working very, very hard to make sure that all of my fellow Mississippians know what we know. I will give Dr. Dobbs and his team immense credit. The, the, their data crunchers are working around the clock. We have as sufficient and as good data as anyone anywhere in the country. And that's because of his team that he's built. But I want you to know what I know. Because I, and by the way, most all of these numbers are on their website. So if you, I'm reading it off of the data that they gave me, but you can go on the State Department of Health's website and see very similar information every single day, county by county data. According to the, the latest information I have, for instance, DeSoto County, we have 2,006 total cases in DeSoto County, but 584 of those are in the last two weeks. That's the reason there's a mask mandate in DeSoto County. Hines County, 2,978 total cases, but 800 of them are new cases in the last two weeks. My friends, we're not just sitting up here saying, willy-nilly, we want you to do this, we want you to do that. It is based upon the information that we have. It's based upon the data that we have. And I assure you that my team and I, in addition to Dr. Dobbs and his team, to Mac and, and their team, we are pouring over the data every single day. I spend hours looking at this information every single day. Nothing that we've done throughout this process have I done lightly. And that is, continues to be the case today. Mac, if you give us an update from a emergency management perspective, please. Yes, sir. I uh, just want to remind uh, that the municipalities and the county's uh, relief uh, fund that we've been working is uh, going well. Uh, we've already started getting applicants to, that come into through the, the FEMA normal uh, reimbursement program, and that's for uh, PPE, food, medical costs, uh, communication uh, enhancements, uh, a, lot of, a lot of different things. Uh, we're about 17 days away from being uh, kicking off the uh, uh, CARES Act portion of that funding strictly uh, going in. It can help uh, those, those counties and, and cities with the unemployment insurance costs, uh, payroll expenses for COVID-19, extra enhancement there, and, and other things. So we're, we're starting to see a great push into our regular normal uh, reimbursement system, but uh, we're also getting prepped for the other, and we've had a couple of conferences already, uh, phone conferences with those uh, applicants and uh, the possible applicants as well as uh, more information to follow and that is on our website we've already got that out there uh, to get a good, good information program so if you have any questions please go there first or and or call MEMA and we're more than happy to help you uh, we have seen an, an uptick in uh, requests for PPE here in the last couple three weeks obviously uh, uh, the governor Reeves and, and uh, Dr. Uh, have, have, have talked about it uh, and so uh, we, we've seen those requests starting to increase if we look at the numbers from, from just last Friday to today, about 430,000 masks to Tier 1 and Tier 3 facilities, as well as 300,000 gloves. So we're starting to see a little bit of, uh, of uh, th those increased cases and increase uh, on our uh, logistics system, but uh, we've already prepared for that. We started last uh, month, and uh, we're already starting to go out here, and our procurement is stepping up uh, even further as well as well as uh, uh, the addition acquisition teams that we have. Uh, we're, we're perfectly poised to be able to respond, but you don't want to have to respond to that type of emergency. So, uh, but we, we did see exactly what Dr. Dobbs and, and others have said, that uh, uh, the, the cases that are going on, it creates a drain on the statewide emergency logistical system. And uh, a little bit of mask wearing, a little bit of procedures, uh, we saw things go down for a while. We saw us able to stockpile and try to get some, um, some of our logistical stock for the future, but now we're starting to see a pull on it uh, because of the, the 13 counties and others that have done that. So, uh, uh, but we're, we're staying ready. We're, uh, Mima, we have plenty of equipment on hand and, and we're ready for the next uh, couple of months, sir. Thank you, Mac. At this time, I'll open the floor to questions. Yes, sir. Governor Reeves, you mentioned a lot about students and preparing them and having masks for 
for those, but uh, what are your concerns for teachers? You know, we heard a lot of them out today, outside of the Capitol today saying that they're concerned for their own safety as they go into the classroom. So what are your concerns for those? Well, I will tell you that I, I am concerned uh, about every single Mississippian. Um, but I will also tell you that right now uh, we have uh, approximately a million Mississippians that are going to and from work every single day. Uh, they are going into an environment that is um, that is safe, and I believe that we can structure uh, our schools in such a way that our teachers uh, can teach, uh, and they can do so in a safe uh, in a safe way and in a safe environment. Um, are there going to be risks? Sure, absolutely. I, I can't stand, sit here and say that there are no risks, but I can also tell you that every single teacher who gets up and, and, and drives to school, and quite frankly, every kid that rides on a school bus to school on our roads does so by assuming a little bit of risk uh, because there are automobile accidents that occur. And so uh, what we've got to be able to do and what we've got to be willing to do is we've got to make sure that, that each of the various districts have uh, plans in place uh, that are sufficient to protect and to mitigate and to minimize the risk that are associated with not only the kids but the teachers and everyone in that school building. I believe that we can do that and I believe it's critically important that we do. Joe. Dr. Dobbs, with a quick follow-up after this question. Uh, has there been any evidence of daycares, kids camps, uh, of children getting sick there? Um, you know, I can't say we haven't had any kids in daycares or in uh, in camps that have begun. In other states, there certainly have been transmission events in kids. Um, but specifically, the science is starting to show that, and and I, it's just so early. It's it's hard to know for sure because we've closed schools and we've limited daycare so much that we don't have a good perspective of when we put kids back in together how likely they are to transmit it. But probably, our youngest children are very unlikely to get severely ill. Um, they might be less contagious to, um, to one another. We don't know that for sure, but there's some suggestion of that. Just, just to caveat it, we're still learning. But very clearly, as kids get older, you go into middle school or high school, they're plenty contagious um, going in. So there's going to be sort of a graduated risk of transmission, at least based on the current science, as kids get older. Teenagers are probably just as contagious as 22-year-olds, and we know 22-year-olds are pretty darn good at spreading it. Um, from our recent experience. So um, there'll need to be different considerations. The good thing is, is that older kids are gonna be a little bit more able to follow, hopefully, social distancing and wear masks and that sort of thing. And if younger kids are less likely to spread it just because of the biology of the situation, that is something in our favor, but it's certainly nothing we should be complacent about. We can't depend on, on um, you know, sort of circumstance, luck of circumstance to get us out of this. Yeah, I, I, I would just add one thing and then I'll, I'll um, let you follow up um, by opening schools and and dealing with approximately uh, 450,000 kids and probably somewhere between 38 and 39,000 teachers uh, and lots of other personnel uh, I, I don't think anyone is suggesting uh, that we can do that and there would be absolutely none of the kids or none of the teachers or none of the personnel that get COVID but I can also tell you that if we don't open schools and we have those 450,000 kids and roughly 50,000 personnel, that if they're not in school, that none of them are going to get COVID. And so um, we're just gonna have to do it in such a way where we mitigate the risk and we do it in such a way that once, if and when we do have an outbreak, that we have a plan in place to uh, address it. Dr. Dobbs, the follow-up is when we do have an outbreak, what's the plan? Yeah, so um, we've been working closely with the schools. Um, I've spoken with, I've had numerous conversations with the Department of Education, educators, superintendents, and I have a huge call with um, boards of education next week. We do have a, um, an outline of what a school should do if they have one case or if they have more than one case in a classroom, or if they have multiple cases in different classrooms or different environments with sort of like a, um, a set of, of guidances, what to do and how to involve us in the process. It's the same thing as we would do for anywhere, except for we have sort of activated it to work in a school environment. If someone has a case of coronavirus, everyone who's within that sphere for a certain duration of time is gonna be considered a contact and will need to be quarantined and set home. If, if it's in such a scenario that you don't realize 
you don't you can't define which kids might have been exposed, then all the kids are going to need to go home for a quarantine period. And so it could be disruptive depending on how common it is within the schools. And then certainly there will be scenarios where there will be multiple micro outbreaks or even massive outbreaks within a school system where considerations for closure will need to be considered. And we're certainly going to be part of that conversation. Yes, sir. A document making the rounds that was drafted in conjunction with the White House says that Mississippi is one of 18 different states in the red zone in terms of COVID-19. This was from our understanding sent to the governors of those states. The report also recommends that states in that red zone should enforce more protective measures to keep the virus from spreading. And they identified 52 of Mississippi's 82 counties they were looking at. What's your take on that report and how that plays a role in the restrictions, not only for counties, but on a state level? What I would tell you is that um, the, the reality is, as we have said from this table for several weeks now, uh, maybe three or four weeks, uh, that Mississippi is certainly in a position in which we have uh, a lot of coronavirus, a lot of COVID-19 in our communities. Uh, there, there are a risk in our communities throughout Mississippi. Um, when I look at, um, I mean, the, the mere fact that that Dr. Burks was here Wednesday and Pete Gaynor was here yesterday um, says a lot. Uh, there's no question. Um, but in talking to both of them, uh, what we are dealing with now is something that for all intents and purposes is being dealt with um, throughout the, the coastal uh, areas in America. Um, and that's true from Washington State to California to Arizona to Texas to Louisiana to Mississippi to Alabama to Florida to Georgia to South Carolina and to North Carolina and, and, and other areas. I think what we're seeing, there's lots of different reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is the, sort of the, the first wave that hit the Northeast um, what was situated such that um, that's where a lot of the attention went. We went through a period of time in late May and early June when there was a lot of diversion of time and resources and, and conversations. Uh, a lot of people perhaps let their guard down uh, here in our states. And quite frankly, I think there's, there are those who believe that there is a, a lot of movement around the country, a lot of migration, a lot of people who uh, maybe were in one state that had, had the virus that went to another and, and sort of were finding ourselves in a second wave. Um, what I would say about all of that is it doesn't really matter how it got here or why it's here. We got to deal with the situation at hand. And the situation at hand is that we have uh, a large number of cases. Uh, we've got to deal with those. We've got to be smart. Uh, we've got to be aware. Uh, we've got to be willing to step up and take care of our friends and take care of our neighbors. Uh, and we know that there are certain things that work. And some of the things that work are wearing a mask, socially distancing, um, and staying out of groups of thousands in bars would certainly be uh, a very helpful mitigation tool as well. And so um, we have had multiple conversations with the uh, members of the Coronavirus Task Force, um, and what they will tell you is, um, I believe, is that um, for, for better or worse, this is month five of us dealing with COVID-19 here in Mississippi, uh, and we are, we are working our way through it. Did Dr. Burks mention this report specifically when she was here? I'll tell you what she mentioned. Um, I don't know that she mentioned the, speci the report specifically. Uh, the criteria that they use, um, she did talk with us a good bit about that, uh, particularly, as you know, we're the criteria that, that we are currently using um, to mandate masks, for instance, in the 13 counties that we currently have and the other 10 or so that I mentioned earlier, um, we're saying 200 new cases over a 14-day period or 500 per 100,000 residents over a 14-day period. Uh, I believe in their report, and I haven't really studied it yet because I literally just saw a copy of it uh, an hour or so ago, uh, but I, I think, and she, but she mentioned her criteria. They're very interested in um, two criteria, number one being on a county by county basis. They, they really don't look at it as a state from a state standpoint, they look at it on a county by county basis. Um, they're saying 100 new cases per 100,000 residents, but it's over a seven day period rather than a 14 day period. And then they're saying 
Uh, the second criteria that they're looking at is actually a positivity rate on testing of greater than 10%, um, which everyone has an opinion. My personal view is that the test positivity rate is not a great uh, indicator in states like Mississippi uh, because it hasn't been real easy for us to convince people to go just randomly test. You know, if you don't feel bad in our state, uh, if you don't have lots and lots of symptoms, uh, we just kind of, our DNA is kind of such that, well, if I don't feel bad, why am I going to go get tested? Um, so um, when your positivity rate, and because of that, our positivity rate has been a little bit higher uh, than a lot of other states throughout this process. And so I'm not being critical of the way in which they look at it. I'm just trying to distinguish between the way in which um, we're making decisions and some of the uh, things that, that they're looking at. And we, we talked through these issues. We had a great breakfast, um, great meeting. Uh, I guess we were with Dr. Burks for almost four hours uh, two days ago. And, um, and, and you know, everyone has a, a different opinion on it. But it's certainly something that we're monitoring. We think it's important. Um, the other thing, I mean, you look at a, a county like, for instance, Issaquina County in Mississippi. Um, we have 301 cases per 100,000 residents. Well, that's a lot more than 100 cases um, per 100,000 residents, but we've had four cases over the last 14 days. We just have, our counties are very different in size, and so I think you've got to look at Hines a little bit different than you look at Issaquina, um, from my perspective. So, Renee? Um, Dave Elliott, WLO Thank you, Renee. Can I request a little follow-up because I need a clarification on something before I ask a question? Sure. Uh, Gov Governor, as far as your order in the 13 counties, including Harrison and Jackson down here, set to expire Monday, I believe you said that you were inclined to extend that, that you weren't announcing today that it has been extended. If I have that right, when will you make that decision? I, I haven't signed the order yet. Um, and but the reason I haven't signed the order yet is because we are still communicating more about um, what counties to add. Uh, I believe it's fair to say that the um, the folks that that watch you every day, Dave, um, with bated breath in Harrison and Jackson counties, um, can expect that order to be extended for at least two weeks beyond Monday. Although I have not signed the order yet. Uh, but it's not because I'm contemplating taking Harrison or Jackson out of the list. Okay, then I'd like to get back to the schools. Uh, that's the big story, I think. Uh, scheduled to start in less than three weeks now. You've already said you uh, plan to proceed with that. We've established teachers groups who are speaking out against that. Have you at least considered de delaying the start of school, maybe into September a couple of weeks, so the state can monitor numbers? give school districts a little breathing room to refine their plans? If the question is, have we considered and or contemplated uh, that action, the answer is absolutely. We've considered and contemplated every action. At this point, we haven't taken any state action. We have given, uh, as we do on virtually every decision, a great amount of autonomy to our local school districts. Uh, that is... Uh, in, in good times, that's exactly the way they want it. In challenging times like now, maybe uh, every district doesn't want to have to make these hard decisions, but uh, we, are, we, are, we have, uh, to date, uh, not made uh, any uh, statewide decision on delaying or otherwise. Uh, the State Department of Education uh, did yesterday, and the board met. Uh, there was the decision that was made that they were not at this point going to reduce uh, the 180 day requirement for the 2020-2021 school year and so we will continue to uh, monitor it again we've got a july 31 um, deadline for every district to uh, put forth what their plan is once we receive those we will very 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 swiftly uh, work with the department of education to review those make sure that they all meet uh, the standards that we set forth um, and that we believe are important uh, for our individual kids, and we'll, we'll go from there. Renee? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I 
Hi, uh, yes. Dr. Dobbs, as hospitalizations and ICU usage continue to rise, can you update us on the total capacity of the state's healthcare system for hospitalizations, intensive care units, and ventilators? And can you add that capacity to the graphs MSDH puts out every day to help people visualize where Mississippi is? Yeah, uh, great question, and I'm, I'm sorry it took so long. It's a little bit more complicated to put out than, than um, it would seem. We're trying to make it in a way that is most usable. This information, I know you can't see it really well, should be on our website today. And it does uh, talk about, so, uh, total bed capacity by public health region, say like for uh, region five, which is the, uh, district five, which is the Jackson area, 1,748 beds are available. There are, um, um, uh, there are, uh, we put how many, uh, Patients are there for COVID, ICU, and by, and by med surge bed. So yes, that will, that will be available this afternoon. Um, I've already submitted to our communications and we're just waiting to get it put on our website. Let me just add to that question because I think it, it helps um, people visualize uh, the challenges that we face and the fact that we do have a significant, a significant amount of virus in our communities. And you've heard me say this number before, but I, I think this, this helps me at least um, understand, and I hope it'll help you. June 27th was not that long ago. Um, it was not that long ago at all. Three weeks, basically. 490 confirmed COVID-19 patients in the hospital. We had a downtick of two between yesterday and today. We still have 853 COVID-19 confirmed patients in our hospitals. That's 363. We had 490 total on June 27th. We've added 363 patients net. Obviously, some have come in, some have gotten out, um, but 363 patients net. Not quite doubled, but certainly uh, headed in that direction. That's the reason you hear us um, pleading to our fellow Mississippians uh, to do everything you can to mitigate uh, this virus. And we know Lee lives and Harold has a question. Um, Jeff Pender with Mississippi Today has a question. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Dobbs, I wanted to ask uh, your thoughts on the new HHA, HHS rule for hospitals to uh, bypass CDC for capacity reporting. Uh, what's going to ask? Is it going to impact how you get those daily numbers at all? And uh, since we can't get that CDC report anymore, uh, would you consider releasing daily aggregate capacity numbers? Uh, like other states. Yeah, and yeah, great question. Thank you. We are, we should have something out this afternoon uh, about the hospitalization numbers by area, by hospital size and capacity. It'll be apparent when you see the different information we have out there for you. Um, on the HHS question, you know, we're not concerned about it. We have a parallel method where we actually every day obtain a lot more detailed information that has been going to CDC or that has been going to HHS. Um, we certainly have, uh, you know, observed this transition from CDC to HHS and, and understand that there are legitimate reasons for doing it. It doesn't seem like a nefarious takeover, honestly. Um, uh, but, you know, we'll continue to do our thing so that we have the data and, uh, and we know that our hospitals will. This is something that's very important, I think, for our hospitals to know is the information they send to HHS is going to be critical for resource distribution how much PPE they get from federal stockpiles, how much of investigational drugs like remdesivir are distributed are gonna be based on this data. So it's very important for our hospitals to submit this information accurately and timely. Yeah, I just wanna reiterate, I mean, we've had, uh, I've spoken to, in, in the last seven days, I've spoken to the secretary of HHS, I've spoken to, uh, obviously, at length, Dr. Burks, uh, and I've spoken to the head of FEMA, who is the resource distributor 
Much like MEMA is sending PPE out every single day to our Tier 1 and Tier 3 facilities, FEMA is who resources us. That's who pays for much of this stuff that's not CARES Act money, but through the Stafford Act. And it has been made clear, uh, and, and I absolutely believe them, uh, as Dr. Dobbs said, uh, this transition uh, in ensuring that the data that is received by HHS um, is for, I believe, one reason and one reason only, and that is for resource allocation. Uh, they are having to make decisions as to how they distribute remdesivir, for instance. Uh, which is a drug that helps a lot of patients, uh, particularly if they can get that drug uh, in, in the early hours of them actually being admitted to the hospital. And so new hospital admissions, for instance, is something that is critically important to how they ultimately decide uh, which hospitals get uh, that drug. We, we know for a fact uh, that uh, we don't have a large enough supply to just send out um, uh, we, by we, I mean the, the federal government, to send out the distribution of those drugs to every single hospital uh, throughout America. And so I do think resource allocation and resource distribution is the primary reason, and there may be some other reason I don't, I don't understand or I don't know about, but I'm convinced that that is certainly what uh, they're telling us across the board, and I, I have reason to believe them. Yes, sir. Governor, along those lines, you know, there's concerns for people, and I hate to always it seems like once a week we're asking you or Dr. Dobbs uh, to put on your Mythbusters hat and, and try to you know dispel something from Facebook. But uh, <laughs> we've seen a lot of concerns, particularly on the Department of Health's Facebook page too, from people commenting about our own reporting being impacted because of the new requirements for HHS. Uh, also too, I wanted to ask a sort of a side note, you know, with the National Guard coming into hospitals to make sure those numbers are being reported correctly. Obviously there have been states that have had issues with that. Uh, can either of you talk about whether or not we've had any issues with hospitals reporting to, uh, in the Magnolia State? Mm -hmm. um, I, I am not aware of any uh, reporting issues personally, um, and I'm not aware, and I, uh, unfortunately for, for him, I talk to Dr. Dobbs pretty much several times a day, and I, I'm not aware of any reporting challenges we've had through the Department of Health, but you may know something yeah. I don't. You know, by and large, our hospitals have done a great job getting information out. I would like to beg their patients because there's multiple reporting lanes they have to work through, and I know there's some redundancy, um, but there's some reason for that. Um, streamlining, you know, it might be worthwhile. But from our perspective, um, every day I look at every single hospital's report, and every once in a while maybe one or two hospitals don't report, and then we get it later in the day or we update it the next day. And so we're typically, you know, close to 100% on all data fields, and we have a lot of data fields. So just thanks to our hospitals for keeping us informed. It's been extremely useful. Yes, sir. And uh, I just want to get some clarification on uh, bars. Um, if you did move forward with um, having to close bars, um, how would that, what would that look like? Would that be part of the state, uh, the county mandates um, that you're doing? It's a great question, and it's one of the reasons we hadn't made final decisions yet. We're thinking through uh, what does that look like? Does it look like a closure? Does it look like we go back to where we were at one time where we had, um, we had curfews in place, for instance? Um, I think uh, as it relates to COVID-19, um, certainly uh, the, the later it is in the evening, it certainly leads to uh, less and less um, social distancing and things such as that. Or does it, rather than having curfews, do we move towards uh, having a bar setting that is much more similar to what we do in restaurants now where we have, for instance, 50% capacity, but also maybe we go to where you, you can't be served unless you are sitting uh, at a table. Uh, I, I will tell you, I've had these, last night I, I was on a call for a couple hours um, uh, late into the evening with my fellow Republican governors and trying to get ideas from them about what, you know, it's not, it's not just about throwing something at a dartboard, it's just trying to listen to my peers from around the country and say, we think this really worked. I mean, and ultimately that's the question that I ask. You know, if we're talking about masks, what do we think actually works? If we're talking about bars, what do we think actually works? Is it is it perhaps the live music, for instance, uh, that is attracting more and more people into the bar setting? These are the questions that we're asking ourselves, that we're talking about uh, amongst each other. And so I can't give you any certainty. Uh, all I can tell you is uh, from, a, 
full disclosure standpoint, these are exactly the conversations we're having. Um, Bobby Harrison with Mississippi State has a question. <laughs> what about the flag commissioner? Are you getting close to making your appointments? Um, we are we are close to making our appointments just as soon as I can uh, get a little bit of time away from dealing with, with COVID, uh, I'll make those appointments. Um, yes. Sarah Palmer with North Politics has a question. Hey, Governor. Uh, Bobby actually asked my question as well. Um, would you, can you touch on the legislative session? You may have done that earlier this week. Is there any idea of when you expect to possibly call a special session um, to look at those education budgets and the Department of Marine Services? Thanks for the question. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, I can't give you any real idea uh, of when that may occur uh, because I'm committed to not bring them back until I believe that it's safe for all of them to come back. Um, as I have been in contact with a number of them uh, and quite frankly, uh, due to several th um, scenarios that have happened, been in contact with some of their spouses, um, what we are seeing, and this is not unusual, but when someone who lives in a household uh, gets the virus, oftentimes the people with whom they live get the virus as well. And so what we're seeing now, I'm afraid, is some of those individuals that have um, contracted the virus have probably um, have other family members that now have it. And so we've got we've to get through a cycle or two or three, I think, um, of, of this spread, which is now over 40, I think the latest number I heard are from the Capitol, um, before we can bring them back in in, a, in an environment that is safe. Uh, I think I've probably ex had a, expressed concern since the beginning of May uh, about the, that particular venue and, and the fact that uh, having served and worked in that, in that building across the street uh, for eight years, at the end of every session, uh, that I had for eight years, uh, I can assure you that from a combination of uh, exhaustion, overwork, uh, and just being in, a, in an old building like that, I felt like I was sick. Uh, every time we signed died the last eight years, I felt like I was sick. And so I was, have been concerned since May. Obviously, the, the amount of spread uh, that has transpired, um, there are still legislators, without question, uh, who got the virus who are still very, very sick right now. And so now is not the time to bring them back. Just for clarification, uh, most of the public schools will go back August 10th. Are you expecting within the next two or three weeks that the numbers will decline before you send them back in the fall? Um, well, I'm not going to send anybody back. The, um, the, the, the uh, local school districts will make their, the, the, their decisions, but I'm, I am inclined to see, um, I think we certainly need uh, our kids back in school. I think it's critically important for uh, their well-being. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that the measures that we are putting in place now uh, is going to slow the spread. Uh, there, is, um, there, there is certainly on a daily basis, we are seeing uh, multiple um, days in a row now that have had over a thousand cases. Um, <clears throat> that concerns me and we're certainly monitoring it very closely. Sheriff Dr. Dobbs, uh, come this fall, we're expecting flu, what we usually do. Uh, how are you going to be able to do your job this fall if we have a continued outbreak of coronavirus and the flu, traditional flu outbreak that we've had? Yeah, um, it's going to be hard. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, one of the good things about social distancing is it works for every virus, not just coronavirus. So um, maybe we'll get catch a little bit of a break um, with masks and social distancing with the flu transmission. Everybody who, who, who can, please get a flu vaccine. It's going to be doubly important right now because it's the summer and we're out of hospital beds in, in a lot of areas and ICU beds. This is normally our slow season for, for hospitalizations, and it's going to be even more tight going into the fall. There's no reason to, or in the, in the winter as, as flu comes on. So certainly anticipate a lot of difficulties. 
Um, flu vaccine is going to be extra important that everybody gets it. And then and the social distancing measures are going to be doubly important when it comes to preventing transmission of virals, viruses. Renee? Uh, Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Governor. Uh, just uh, I, I remember yesterday you expressed, Governor, that uh, being on the coast, there was a, a lot of good feeling about how everybody was wearing masks. And uh, my my question is more about your thoughts on uh, being down on the coast. They have canceled a pretty large event called Jeeping the Coast down here, but then also they have an event the coliseum is hosting by a an artist that you might be familiar with jamie johnson and they have reportedly sold around two thousand tickets and they for the coast coliseum event tomorrow can you kind of express to me your thoughts i mean there's a different different transition because the events are both big one being canceled but the other one happening what uh, what can we look for? Well, well, thank you, uh, Hunter, for the question. It was good to see you uh, yesterday um, down in Bay St. Louis at the Ground Zero Museum. Um, that was certainly a um, a great event. I thought uh, I was very impressed. As I said, every single person that was um, in that particular press conference, every elected official. And by the way, we were in Hancock County, which is not on our list of 13, but every single person uh, that was there had on a mask. Every single person that was there was socially distanced. Uh, that included every elected official in Hancock County. There were f we, we attended uh, an event with some firemen. Uh, we attended some events with some policemen. And, um, and that, that made me uh, very pleased to be out and about and see that. Um, I think that uh, we there, most things in society that are going on right now can be done in a safe way if we will if we are outdoors and we are wearing a mask and we are socially distanced though that combination of things significantly reduces the risk of spread and that's true if it's two people or 200 people now we certainly want to uh, make sure that we um, are very vigilant about the way in which we do that, that we have uh, a setting where um, that there, it is possible to socially distance. I'll give you an example. I was talking to one of my uh, good friends who's a mayor down there, and, um, and he was telling me about two different bars. He said one of the, the, they both are outdoors, which is certainly better than an indoors bar, but on one of the outdoor bars, they have a very large patio, they have people uh, seated at tables, and there's four or five or six or eight people per table, and you're able to get six feet apart, and it seems like a relatively safe environment. This is what he's telling me. And then there's another bar that, for whatever reason, it's outdoors, but people have to congregate very, very close to one another because there's a very small space. And so you can see the difference as whereas one is much safer, neither one are 100% safe. There is no such thing as 100% safe uh, in, in this uh, environment in which we live, but there are little things, there are measures we can take uh, to make things more safe uh, than others. So, Renee, you're good. One more, uh, Well, actually for Dr. Dobbs, um, and again, I, I know you guys talk a lot on these various news conferences, and I'm not trying to get you to reiterate something you might have said earlier in the week, but uh, we're hearing more concerns about this new strain um, of coronavirus in our area, in this part of the country. Can you talk more about that and, and uh, how it's different from what we're seeing in other places? And a lot of people are, are very concerned, and lack of information breeds fear. Yeah, so um, I'm not aware that we have, well, we're looking at some genetic analysis, but I don't know that we have a lot to speak specifically about um, local stuff, but there there is a strain of coronavirus that seems to be more transmissible, but no evidence of increased uh, you know severity. So uh, yeah, I mean it, it, it's it's there, and, and could that be part of our issue right now? You know, sure, absolutely. If you have a more transmissible virus, it's going to be uh, more problematic. So that 
the, the studies that have been done so far show that that more transmissible strain has pretty much supplanted the older one. It's just a single point mutation on the surface protein. So it's not a, it's not a hard mutation to obtain. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's probably in play. Absolutely. But it doesn't change what we do. It's not going to make people, um, we don't think it's going to make people die at any higher rate. We're certainly not seeing that. As a matter of fact, I think our mortality is a little bit better as we learn to treat this a little bit better. And, uh, and earlier and more aggressively. Uh, so, uh, you know, th that's, all is not woe and misery. Um, we can do what we got to prevent on the front end, but once you get sick, please seek care because there are effective things that can be done no matter how sick you are. All righty, uh, Dr. Dodd, I guess this is kind of for you. I know the hospitals in Jackson are really pushed to the limit. You talked about having to send a patient to uh, Alabama. We're pretty solid down here right now. But a doctor told me if the next four weeks or anything like the last four weeks, it could get critical. What kind of contingency plans are in place? I know Camp Shelby's been talked about. You and the governor toured the Air National Guard base. If Supply and demand issues with patients and hospital capacity hit some kind of uh, critical mass. What kind of plans are in place? Well, there are multiple layers of plans. And so, uh, you know, there are plans that need to be activated now. And one of the things that we're going to, we've emphasized with our health systems and that we'll continue to emphasize, and we'll probably have some uh, revised health officer orders out later today is that every hospital needs to activate surge capacity. Every hospital has a surge capacity plan and only a few have activated it as far as additional beds and ICUs. And so that's gonna be our first level. Um, there's two parts of the equation. There's a influx and an efflux sort of thing. So um, right now, you know, we are limiting elective surgeries that require hospitalizations. Um, uh, we're looking to permit some of that if a hospital can maintain the ability to take care of incoming patients, whether they're COVID patients or non-COVID patients. Uh, but going forward, all those are considerations. And then beyond that, there are even more extreme contingencies, even within each, each hospital, where you can go to a ward format, or you can double bed, or you know, even crisis level, where you don't have the normal sort of staffing ratios that you that, that we want to have optimally. Um, and then past that, you know, certainly you'd have to bring in you know maybe additional sort of emergency assets. But there's several layers forward. We're going to have to activate the first level, but there is no amount of preparing that if we don't stop the influx of new patients, there is no amount of contingency that can overcome everybody acting irresponsibly because there's just not, there's not enough contingency in the world if everybody gets coronavirus. Yeah, I just, one of the things that I have not yet mentioned that I want to mention, because um, I think this question certainly, um, uh, should I think the people of Mississippi should know this? Um, you've heard me say over the last several weeks uh, that within our executive orders there is a requirement that hospitals maintain 25 percent of their uh, capacity for COVID patients. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with uh, those in the healthcare space with Dr. Dobbs and his team, and I think it's I think it's becoming, um, and admittedly, we're all learning uh, through uh, a very difficult situation, but I think it's becoming more clear to all of us that that 25% requirement uh, is probably not realistic uh, for most of our, our hospitals, um, and that what may be more realistic is a 10 to 15% requirement. But I think it's also fair to say that in many instances, um, we need our, our hospitals to uh, step up and do some of those things like Dr. Dobbs just mentioned in terms of, of being able to activate their surge capacity um, plans. And I think that we're going to uh, find ourselves sooner rather than later in an environment um, in which uh, as we monitor on a on a individual hospital by hospital basis uh, that if they are are not either able to maintain 10 percent of their capacity or 15 percent of their capacity for COVID patients and they're not willing to 
um, enhance their surge capacity, then we're going to have to go beyond from an elective surgery standpoint where we are right now. Uh, right now, elective surgeries are uh, limited um, primarily on those that are most likely to require hospitalization, uh, but we may have to go even further than that. And so we're we are we are working a lot of different angles, doing a lot of different things uh, to attempt to uh, make sure that uh, our individuals throughout Mississippi do the right thing, uh, while at the same time work to ensure uh, that those in the hospital space do the right thing as well. And um, and we've got a lot of good people doing a lot of good things, and we need to celebrate that. Uh, but we got to make sure that we can um, that we can make sure that occurs across the board. One last question, I believe Anita, who tried to get on earlier and was unable to, so if we can get her. Okay, I got that mute button this time. Thank <laughs> you, I'm sorry. Um, this is for uh, Dr. Dobbs. I'm wondering, Dr. Dobbs, I've been using my stories for a while, the number you gave about uh, having 200 contact tracers working, and I'm wondering, you, you were trying to add more, so I'm wondering if, if that number needs to be updated. Um, or if 200 is still a good number. And secondly, I was wondering about testing and um, uh, more widespread access to testing, if we could expect that. I've seen the UMMC website and, and other testing providers are still limiting testing to people with respiratory symptoms or in the case of UMMC, if you've been in contact with someone who's had COVID. Yeah, so um, great question. So on the contact tracing, um, actually I was ready for the answer a couple days ago, so I'm gonna be a little bit behind. Um, we had 196 committed uh, Department of Health and we had added additional 30, so you know, about 226. And then since then we've ad added additional contracts. Um, we've, uh, we've, just, we've hired 14 people in the, in the different regions around the state to kind of help with uh, like nurses for that purpose. And we're also putting out a, um, uh, an RFP for about 100, uh, contact investigators to add to that list that should be coming out very soon and then other state agencies um, uh, especially one state agency has volunteered to, to donate some folks so we're continuing to build our teams uh, but every time you build a team it's not just adding people you have to do training and have space and IT capacity and all that kind of stuff so it's always sort of adding sort of things so we're we're continuing to build um, you know we went we had five-fold increase in cases but not a five-fold increase in staff so that's a pretty tough nut to crack so we're, we're trying to crack it um, and then on the testing piece you know testing is it, it, every 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 resource is exhaustible whether it's a hospital bed whether it's PPE or whether it's testing the solution is not to get infected and the pathway to that is masks six feet and avoid groups right and so um, you forgive my frustration that everybody wants the magic bullet of the contact tracing or the testing or the vaccine when the solution is just plainly obvious in front of us for everyone to see. And um, I'm, I'm baffled that, that the simplest of solutions is the one that we refuse to, to broadly uh, adopt. Um, but uh, certainly we continue to test at the Department of Health. We're looking to add additional testing. We, we have multiple testing locations um, over the weekend. I know we've got uh, like Columbus and, uh, and Wayne County and some other places. So go on our website for testing locations. Um, we're a little bit of a victim of the national trends because whenever the big guys sneeze, we catch a cold, right? So if Texas and Florida suck up all the testing supplies, there's not going to be anything left for Mississippi. So um, it, these are going to be ongoing challenges. The uh, Department of Health, UMC, we haven't exceeded our capacity. We're still at 24, 48 hour turnaround for our endeavors. Um, and we'll continue to um, try to grow those. But every resource is exhaustible. So please, please be careful. I would just add, and this will conclude today's briefing. Um, one of the challenges that we have right now is there are, uh, because of the explosion of cases in very large states like Arizona and Texas and Florida. Um, the, many of the private labs are behind uh, and we are getting results that are, um, let's just say, not exactly timely. And so we've got to not only look at, it's fine to look at the total number of new cases today, but that date of onset of illness chart uh, is critically important to the decision making that Dr. Dobbs and I have to make. Uh, it's not just about the new cases today, because we may be reporting a new case today, 
that actually was tested on Sunday or Monday or maybe even longer than that. And so, again, at full disclosure, <laughs> um, full transparency, uh, that is one thing to look at. But if you're only looking at that, um, it's probably not the, the only data set piece you ought to look at. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you is um, the data is the data, but what we believe at this time uh, and I understand if you're skeptical, by the way, because there was a time when the uh, folks at the World Health Organization said masks would not help. They said that in March. That's regardless of what was said then, we believe, and this is a pretty uniform uh, consensus opinion today, that if you wear a mask, if you stay outside, if you are more than six feet apart, you significantly reduce the likelihood that you're going to spread the virus. And the best way for us to deal with the situation that we're currently in is to slow transmission in the community. And the best way to slow transmission in the community is to be outside, go to work, go home, put on a mask, stay six feet apart. That's the formula. Thank you all. Have a great day. God bless.